Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. I've been already present. <laughs> so we stay in, on track. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, our effort to try to understand why we need to sleep. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, acknowledge that this work is done in collaboration with Giulio Tononi at the Wisconsin Institute for Sleep and Consciousness. It's funded by NIH and the DOD, and I have no conflicts of interest to declare. So we try to understand why we need to sleep, and we think to do so, you have to start from the very fundamental feature that distinguishes sleep from any other waking behavioral conditions, including quiet wake. And that is partial sensory disconnection. When we are awake, we are unable, by when we are asleep, we are unable, by definition, to respond promptly to potentially a very dangerous situation. And uh, we and all the animals that have been studied so far do sleep. Therefore, there must be at least one function, or one basic essential function, that is carried out much better, if not only during sleep, they cannot be carried out during quiet wake. Otherwise, we think from an evolutionary standpoint, it would be very difficult to justify why you are keeping this potentially very dangerous state. That function, we think, is synaptic homeostasis. Synapses, of course, are the basis of how the brain works. There are many of them, 100 trillion or so just in the human uh, neocortex. And most synapses that you see in a mammalian brain look like this. So they have uh, are axospinous synapses, excitatory glutamatergic synapses. So there is a pre-synapse, the axonal bouton, that is contacting the head of a spine, the post-synapse. Uh, um, synapses are many, and they account for the bulk of the brain's energy budget. Uh, there are different calculations, but overall they agree between 70 or 80 percent of the total amount of brain's uh, uh, ATP goes to sustain synaptic activity. So synaptic activity is very important, but it has to be controlled very tightly simply because it's energetically extremely expensive. The idea that we have been testing over the last 15 years or so is very simple. It's called the synaptic homeostasis hypothesis, and it states that basically when you are awake, which is the red part uh, here, you're always learning something new because your brain needs to adapt uh, to an ever-changing environment. It's not only when you go to a class or to a lecture like uh, uh, today. And the overall effect of this ongoing learning is an increase in synaptic strength because most of the, not all, but most forms of learning are mediated through synaptic potentiation. So at the end of the day, you have more stronger synapses all over your brain. And sleep, according to this hypothesis, is needed then to provide a synaptic renormalization and overall synaptic weakening to bring back the uh, synaptic strength to a baseline uh, level. There are, as I mentioned, neurobiological constraints and informational constraints that are uh, the basis of why you need to do so. Neurobiological, like energy, because you can't just keep going up. Going up is good because it's a sign of learning, but it's unsustainable in the long run. You need to go down. And informational, because if you keep strengthening your synapses, at the end they will saturate, and the ability to learn new things will be lost. So these are the points of this hypothesis that I don't have to go into details and explain, but I think the, the, the first points are quite established and not, not controversial at all, that most learning happens through potentiation, and that requires a process of renormalization. But then we are saying this process happens primarily during sleep, and in fact, it is exactly because of this renormalization that we can account for all the beneficial effects of sleep at the cellular as well as at the systems level. At the cellular level, simply because then you go back and therefore you save energy and supplies, and at the systems level, you can account for all the cognitive benefits of sleep, and I'll come back to that. So 
You know, there are many, many studies showing that if you try to implement learning rules, for instance, in a network, uh, then immediately you need to implement a renormalization, weakening rules, because otherwise you run out in runaway potentiation and total saturation. So this is a very, very well recognized need. But I think in our field, most people think that the brain is smart enough to be able to maintain this balance of synaptic weight at any given time. So that, uh, let's say, now hopefully you are strengthening some synapses related to what I'm telling you, but simultaneously you are awakening other synapses that you are not using so that the balance is maintained. And instead what we are saying is that the balance is maintained across the 24 hours, but not at any given time. And so there is a time, the day, that is when you end up with a net increase in synaptic strength because you are exposed to the environment. I arrived yesterday here. I, have already, I remember I have many traces of what happened to me uh, coming back to San Francisco. The neuromodulatory milieu in the brain was all been, uh, promoting synaptic strengthening in wake high levels of catecholamines, serotonins, dopamines, acetylcholine, are all promoting synaptic potentiation, and that's what happened. Then there is a time sleep when instead the sleep, uh, synaptic weakening is promoted because the neuromodulatory milieu is the opposite and therefore is promoting synaptic depression rather than potentiation. I am disconnected, and I come back to the a uh, fundamental feature of sleep. So I'm no longer slave of the here and now. I'm disconnected from the environment. My, my neurons are still very active, actually more or less active synchronously. And so there is a perfect time to do a comprehensive sampling of all synaptic weights. And through this sampling, then I can do this synaptic smart, we call it down selection. Now I realize it's very difficult then to explain how exactly this process happens. In fact, we have new molecular and electrophysiological evidence starting to specify exactly how this can happen. And I'm very happy to discuss this in the discussion if we have uh, uh, time. But I want just to show, so this smart down selection is very important to, because he has to account for the cognitive benefits of sleep which are not simply that the next day you are able to learn again, but you have consolidated the memories. You have also forgotten many irrelevant details, which is also extremely important, and you have done gist extraction. And all this can only happen, we think, through a process of smart down selection. So the idea is simple. It's not so simple to test because that requires to uh, measure in vivo synaptic strength and we have been trying to do so uh, over many years uh, using different markers of synaptic strength in different species, literally from flies to humans. And I want to show you some of the, very briefly, some of the previous data to uh, support this claim that there is an imbalance between wake and sleep. Uh, I'm going to show you then ultrastructural data and some new data using a new molecular marker. And then I'm going to finish talking a little bit about developmental studies. So perhaps the best established marker at the molecular level for synaptic strength in glue excitatory synapses is the expression of the AMPA receptors, especially the GLUE1 containing AMPA receptors. And on the left, you see a by now old study in which we show that if you take the entire cortex or the hippocampus of a rat, you extract synapses and you measure the expression of these receptors, the dark columns are the wake condition. Overall, there is a 30% increase in the expression of these receptors relative to the gray columns that is sleep. And these data were recently on the right were uh, confirmed by Rick Uganir's lab at Johns Hopkins using the mouse uh, forebrain. Now you can use electrophysiological, classically electrophysiological markers. You can stimulate by electrical stimulation or TMS in people, measure the monosynaptic response and the slope or the amplitude of the response is a readout, indirect readout of, of synaptic efficacy. And here is a study in humans showing the slope of the response across different time periods, the 
uh, red column is slip deprivation, so showing that the slope keeps going up for the same amount of stimulation, the longer subjects are awake. And then it goes down after subjects are being allowed to go to uh, sleep. But recently we thought that perhaps the most stringent way to test the hypothesis was through ultrastructure because there is a very strong correspondence. If synapses are stronger, they should also be bigger. So overall, it should be the most synapses after wake grow and literally they shrink after sleep. So we have been using serial block phase scanning electron microscope to acquire stack of images from primary cortex in the mouse or hippocampus uh, in, in the mouse and literally reconstructing the dritting branches, axons and the synapses. All this was done, still is done manually, so it's very, very uh, time consuming. They are the branches, they pass on uh, axon, and what we are really interested in is the red area, which is the direct area of contact between the pre-synapse, the boot-on, and the post-synapse, and that's a measure, a structural measure of synaptic strength. So the first study that we did it took five years, five people working full-time, uh, and we are comparing sleeping animals, sleeping mice, uh, after six, seven hours of sleep, relative to two groups of spon uh, awake mice, either after six, seven hours of spontaneous wake or forced wake. And we reconstructed almost 7,000, fully reconstructed 7,000 synapses. And this is the main result. Each dot is one of these axon spine interface. And you see that overall in the, the blue dots in sleep go down relative to the two groups, the two wake groups. Overall, we see an 18% decrease at the population level in the size of synapses in primary motor and primary sensory cortex in superficial layers in these, in these animals. Uh, plotted there is the log normal distribution in this, in this ASI size or synapse size is the same, which is expected. And what we see, the difference that we see is all in this majority, 80% or so of synapses that are the small and medium. The very, very large one, which would be those like this very large mushroom synapse, do not seem to change between sleep and wake. We don't know why. We think perhaps those are the strongest, oldest, committed synapses. They don't really change uh, easily just across sleep and wake. Very briefly, we have done recently the same in the same animals. We look at another region, the CA3 to CA1 connections in the hippocampus. And the overall 7,000 plus synapses, the overall results, there are many details, but is the same. So overall sleep brings down the size of these synapses. Actually, here there is, there is an interesting difference. The blue uh, outlines the small or medium synapses. Those, when you compare those synapses relative to sleep deprivation, they go down with sleep not only in size, but also in number. So that's very uh, interesting. Now, these are unpublished data that I just want to mention. And the new marker that we are using is the CEP GLUE1. That's a marker that allows you to detect that would be the green spot, uh, literally only the, uh, the um, uh, receptors, the AMPA receptors that are on the surface of the synapse. So we know they are functionally relevant. And we also have a structural market, the red one, that allows us to measure the size of the synapse. We do this in motor cortex to be able to express these markers exactly when we want, which is only motor cortex, only superficial layer. You need to do intra in utero electroporation. Then we let the animals grow and we do this repeated to photo imaging only when they are adult. And we image them four or five times, as you see there, Time zero is before sleep and then after sleep. Then we uh, train them in a motor task that we know is sleep dependent. And then after that, we either allow them to go to sleep or we sleep deprive them. The main result is here. And what you see is between 24 and 17 is the difference how the overall expression of these receptors goes down during normal sleep. There was no learning before. Then at time zero is just after they learn something new, motor co complex will, motor task, this is motor cortex. As expected, we see a big increase in the expression of these receptors. And, now, and then from time zero to seven hours, 
in the animals that were allowed to sleep, we still see a net decrease in the expression of these receptors. So the overall effect of sleep and net renormalization is still happening even after, immediately after learning. But very importantly, you see in the group of animals that were not allowed to sleep. Instead, this renormalization does not happen. So it's not just that it happens because of passage of time, you really need sleep. And we can also correlate, actually, this change in the expression of these receptors correlates with change in performance in these animals after sleep. Now, I want to finish in my four minutes just mentioning two studies that we did in young animals. Uh, the maturation of cortex in, in mice uh, follows very closely what happens in, in humans, and the mouse model is very useful because basically what happens in the first week corresponds <coughs> to what happens in preterm babies. We know there are a lot of studies showing that the main oscillatory pattern that we see in mice or rats, in rodents in general, which is the spindle burst, this very high uh, activity, bursty activity on a background of isoelectric EEG, is exactly the same that we see in preterm babies, uh, and they're called the delta brushes. But in mice, of course, we know, and that's the, on the left, exactly what happens in terms of uh, firing activity in cortex related to this oscillatory activity that you can record from EEG of LFP. And basically, the take-home message uh, of this is that there is a maturation. At one point, the spindle burst will disappear, and it will be instead uh, um, substituted by a continuous EEG in which finally, the end there, you will be able to see the slow waves of sleep. This only happens when finally corticocortical synapses are formed. And as shown here, there are many, many studies, electromicroscopy studies showing that this does not happen very gradually. There are actually in two days between the P13 or P14, at the end of the second week in mice, there is an explosion in the formation of cortical, cortical synapses. So we ask, is this process of renormalization of sleep also happening here at this critical time when the brain is so plastic and is forming so many synapses? So we study PAPS, P13, almost two-week-old PAPS. It's very difficult, but at this age, we are already able reliably to define behaviorally sleep and wake. But they are very polyphasic, so we can only have two conditions, the sleeping pups and the sleep-deprived pups. We don't have spontaneously awake pups at night because they never are awake for too long. And we do the same serial block reconstruction in motor cortex, uh, 2,500 synapses. Of course, as expected, the left is a dendrite of one of these pups. There are fewer, fewer synapses because they are still forming, and they are smaller on average relative to a one-month-old mouse. But the main result of sleep when we measure is the same. In fact, if anything, this difference, this renormalization with sleep relative, in this case, to sleep deprivation, is greater. So overall, at the population level, the decrease is 34%. And is happening in all synapses, not just in the 80% of the synapses. But that's probably because, again, at, the, at that time, everything is new. So we have evidence from this that this process, if anything, is even more prominent early on in development. And I want to finish by um, mentioning this study that we did actually a few, few years ago in collaboration with the Allen Institute. Um, we asked, well, you know, we all in, in the sleep field, we all believe that sleep is very important and especially important during development. And then if you impair sleep chronically during development, there should be long-term consequences. It's very difficult, though, to prove this because of a lot of confounding effects, for instance, of how you enforce sleep loss in a very young animal. So this was our attempt, chronic sleep restriction in mice at P25 to P30, so adolescent mice. Then we let them go recover. And then when they are adult, after having injected a, viral, a, vi a virus that uh, allows the labeling of axons, we study the projections from one area, which was a motor association cortex in this case, so uh, an area that is supposedly still undergoing 
uh, refinement of connections during early adolescence. And we ask, uh, do we see any change? And I have five seconds. At the overall level, if you look at the different regions, it's very difficult, at one region at a time, to see a statistically significant difference. So what you see, the, proje the projection density on the left there, the top, higher than zero, are the controls. Overall, they seem to have higher projection density than the sleep-restricted animals, but it's not statistically significant. But if you use machine learning algorithm, they quite accurately are able, taking the entire pattern, to distinguish sleep restricted from, from controls. So the, the take home message is probably the effect is there, is not homogeneous across regions. So if you only look at one region, you may miss, and, but it's probably uh, there. So it's certainly something that we need to <laughs> pursue. Thank you. Uh. Yes. Do fetuses sleep, or does sleep begin uh, only after birth? Is that known? What do you mean by sleep? So well, you know, we you look, are. If you measure brain activity, you can. Yes. I mean, there are distinctive differences in pattern or even activity. Of course, that would be correlated maybe with the mother. So at, at the beginning, what you see is this activity as the delta brushes of the, on, a, on a bed of no activity, because the only synapses there are the thalamocortical synapses, the first one to establish. At that time, in babies as well as in pups, behaviorally, there is no correspondence between the activity and the behavior. So, you know, we are used to trust behavior and EG to define the states, but that definition starts only in a mouse after P14. I would assume that in babies it's the same. Does it mean the sleep does not exist before? I don't believe so, it's just the definition. And you remember, all these cortical activity, etc. at the end is a reflection most likely of non-REM cortical sleep. But sleep, phylo phylogenetically, the first sleep is brainstem sleep, is REM sleep. So that sleep must be there even before. It's not that it's not there, it's that, that we cannot measure. So many people would assume, would say that sleep is the default state from which then you wake up. I think I will take my pivot privilege of chairman to ask one question. <laughs> so yes. this is, uh, if in your I, hypothesis, a lot of the remodeling is synapse specific. So how do you see the molecular mechanism occurring at the level of the synapse and maybe at the level of independent synapses as opposed to, you know, one neuron has many synapses? There, there are, the system is probably very refined. So there is a process that is quite broad and then there are subtypes of, so first of all, it can be at the neuronal level. We have evidence that I mentioned, not from our studies, but actually studies yeah. done here in San Francisco from uh, Gulati and Gulianis and their fantastic model of neuroprosthetic learning. So that model tells us that as long as you use to learn some neurons, the activity of those neurons is preserved during sleep more than the other non-causally related neurons. And those neurons, the next day, maintain a higher level of firing than the non-causally related neurons. What happens to the synapse, specific synapse, we don't know, because they, they cannot track. So that's at the neuronal level. At the synaptic level, there are, we know, molecular markers, so Omer, ARC would be one of them, in which we know in other, in other models, these molecules are induced by wake as immediately genes, but then they go inside the spines, the synapses, in an activity-dependent manner. And some go in the spines that are more active, and some like ARC in the ones that were not active, and they then promote the AMPA endocytosis. So we start understanding that you know, through these activity-dependent, calcium-sensitive-dependent, probably, processes, 
you can have a broad process or very specific process. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Raphael? Go ahead. Sorry? Oh, uh, Tom. Yeah, I, I think you might have answered this, but my question was how you conceptualize sleep-dependent learning. Um, in, in the setting of global synaptic downscaling, do you see that there is a a small area of privileged uh, sparing of that or even enhancement of synaptic strength during sleep. You are talking sleep. about new learning du during sleep? Yes. Um, I think the system evolved not to learn during sleep because it makes, to me, very little sense that you learn when you are not exposed, when your brain is disconnected. Ah, consolidation. Yeah, no, that's different. Well, then, then the protection, so this smart down selection means that some synapses must, or some entire neurons that were involved in learning must be protected, must somehow escape this down selection. And one way we know this is happening is, as I mentioned, the fact that if you think about it, it makes sense, it's, it's trivial in one sense. If neurons potentiate because they learn and they are more strongly connected to each other, when you let the network run in sleep and everything fires, those neurons are poised to be more connected and fire more together. That co-firing protects them from going down. There are, there are data supporting this. So that's already a way of selecting. And it's not that the brain, you know, it's based on what uh, happened during wake. So that's the, the way you favor the learning. Is you favor simply because you protect that relative to everything else that goes down. Okay, unfortunately we have to get going, but I think you forget REM sleep. Maybe you can learn during REM sleep. I think REM sleep is the basis and the fundamental point that they made that, you know, what makes sleep promoting depression is the low levels of most neuromodulators. REM does that even better than non-REM. So REM to me does the same, even better. Mm -hmm.